Hello, I'm Jamie. I'm the Technical Architect of the Science Museum and um, work alongside Callion on the technical side of Heritage Connector. Um, I'm going to let Callion talk a bit about the more deep sense stuff. I'll give you a very quick overview of sort of where some of our thoughts of this came from originally um, from a technical thing point of view. Um, so we started off that our collection was basically a small island of thin days, and I think this is kind of quite common across a lot of museum collections. Um, and so we'd been looking for quite a while, looking at how we could connect it up. Um, and we'd see that there's been a lot of work and kind of linked open data and different ways to connect stuff up. And one of the things that sort of occurred to us was the curatorial documentation resources to go in and make all those connections was a very extremely limited resource. So we kind of thought, could we start using computational power to kind of build those links at scale? So not not necessarily perfect link to a curatorial documentation level, but enough links and connections that would allow us to sort of bring our objects together. And even if they weren't necessarily linked, um, put things in the sort of same space as other things. So I, I think Kelly and I will talk to it in a minute. But so even if we know that we can't connect one of our objects with another object to one of our people, we could say actually sits within a similar space, which lets us kind of bring collections together without actually having to manually go and explicitly link them. Um, here's the example. This is our uh, circle space suit. Um, it's kind of one of our main items, but it actually, it's just quite thin data. We've got a sort of date on there. We've got it's made in Russia. Um, inside the museum, that Russia actually isn't even linked to an ID or any resource. It's just string Russia. Um, obviously, Russia is pretty unambiguous, but if you start getting place like Birmingham, it's sort of which Birmingham are you looking at? So there's this sort of disambiguation question of even for stuff we know on our pages that is field based and um what is that related to and then that comes down to sort of people this doesn't actually have any people or company on it um and in the place case places sort of disambiguation of who is which place start off we had a john smith which john smith is it um we do have a lot of text on it it's just we'll come into the second but this is one of the things we looked at could we use some of this text which actually has a lot of the information that isn't up here um you can see over on the right, we have got Helen Sharman, but we that's better. But actually, inside this text, we've got sort of circle and we've got sort of dates and stuff. Um, so we looked at it and thought, could we actually start using some of that um, to kind of give more context to this page? Um, so, yeah, how could we use the sort of the existing digital tools and methods to build relationship scale um, between poly and inconsistently catalogued digital collections? Um, so, let's come back to this point really of rather than sort of spending thousands of man hours to kind of manually link it which still that this isn't necessary to replace that but it's kind of could we build could we build connections that actually may then be useful to um curatorial documentation start to sort of tighten up some of those relationships so it's sort of let, let's get some relationships built and then we can look at how good those relationships are um is it scalable to larger volumes and this is as we looked at different kinds of collections kind of working out the taxonomies between very different kinds of collections. And one of the things we've brought in is our blog collections, our blog articles and our journals. And those don't even really have um, sort of a data structure in the way you traditionally think. So very, they're just really blocks of text. Um, so how can we really quickly sort of bring collections closer together without actually having to go and sort of work on very tight taxonomies and agree in terms of how those taxonomies would link. Um, and then this point of human input really was if you have a limited uh, amount of human sort of expert documentation, curatorial people, where is it best to put it? Um, can you use computers to do some of the grant work and use sort of the expert knowledge to sort of tighten up those links? Um, and sort of one of our thoughts when maybe come to this project, where actually could we actually use your human to sort of work out what links we have and then actually um, look at using humans sort of just a, a much lower level to sort of weed out things that were obviously wrong. Um, so that's the thought. Um, and the idea is to move from a small lines of collected data to a sort of an interlinked web of data. So one of the big things you've seen the top left and the bottom right is wiki data, which we've used quite heavily as a reference point to um, join data together. So this isn't necessarily, um, that we're not, we're not really about sort of well, we can pull in Wikidata, but it's 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 not necessarily that we're sort of fixed to Wikidata. One of the really beautiful things is Wikidata it describes a huge amount of people um, and things in in the world around us. So it makes a really great 
joining point between one collection and another that Wikidata becomes the joining point. For those who don't know, Wikidata is the sort of data source under sits underneath Wikipedia. Um, so we kind of, and if you're looking at the small connected data, it's sort of we connect things up to Wikidata and then going out through Wikidata to other data sources. Um, and we've, we've on the right there, we've used sort of graph, and we'll talk a lot about graphs today. Um, but one of the ideas is actually, can we place things that are near to each other rather than them actually explicitly have to be linked? So um, the thought sort of the sort of relation thing, of, I mean, one thing we talked a lot in the, music, in the project was about sort of music relationships that some bands sit near other bands, but they're not necessarily connected to them. And it was, how do we kind of express those links at something similar or near to something without it actually being the same as it? Um, and so then the affordances really with sort of the seven disks of discovery, linking isolated records and bringing those in. So if you've got millions of records and blog posts and big archives of text data, can we mine those for things that may be related, related to the articles, um, to the object records we have, so and making richer objects? Um, the new entry points. So, I mean, one of the things we don't have in the Science Museum collection is, is actually events. And so one of the outcomes is could we pull out events and make events and an entry point. So if you wanted to know everything around I don't know, the Great Exhibition or World War II, could you use the techniques we've been using to kind of bring in those collect those objects and articles that are related to that? Um, on the right there, um, there's sort of a a macro view of the whole collection, which is kind of sometimes hard to, especially for our collection and maybe the VNA, which is the two collections. How do you visualize this like vast collection and to some extent this sort of universe model of um and we'll come and skip being in a bit as well, but sort of looking at it as this sort of giant universe you can explore through. Um, and then also at the record level, enriching the and enriching the actual object records to go outwards. Um, and then finally was the new forms of interfaces to actually let you explore this rather than just having a keyword search. So if you don't know what you're looking for or you find an object and you want to explore from then outwards um, and means to doing that. Um, I'm going to hand you over now to Kalyan. You can hopefully talk through a bit more of the, the technical the technical details of how we did this. So Kalyan, you want to start sharing? Hi, I'm Kalyan. Um, I joined the project when most of the ideas that Jamie was talking about were pretty fully formed. Um, and I um, wrote most of the code and designed most of the systems to do what I'm just about to show you. So I'll spend 15 minutes giving you a whistle stop tour of what we built and then 15 minutes giving you a whistle stop tour of some of the demos that we made to show um, potential um, benefits of doing something like this. Um, so here is a diagram, a schematic of everything that we built to um, generate a knowledge graph from one collection, multiple collections. Um, so three main kind of um, parts, which I'll go through in turn. Um, Turning tabular collection data, so we start with CSV exports from the collections management system into a knowledge graph and then two sets of processes on the right hand side, which I'll talk to you about more in a bit. Um, but we'll start on what I've called the ingestion process, um, a three step process to turn data that Jamie described into the starts of a knowledge graph. So um, the first step, which is pretty simple is we had a bunch of CSVs and we wanted, we wanted to convert them into RDF. So what we chose for our main RDF representation was JSON-LD and we stored um, JSON-LD in Elasticsearch indices. Um, JSON-LD was nice because it's super familiar to a bunch of programming language interfaces um, while JSON is so it's pretty easy to pick up if you're designing an API or something and Elasticsearch has kind of speed and text search benefits as well. Um, the second step to create um, RDF was, as Jamie said, we have a lot of uncontrolled fields in the collection. So for example, here's a person nationality British and born um, in this place in India. Um, both of those are strings in um, the current collections management system. So you might have problems disambiguating um, 
similar, uh, all the same places, the same name, but uh, they're actually different places. Um, same goes for, this is part of an object record. So materials, again, are strings, um, object types are strings here as well. Um, so we thought it would be really useful when we're looking at creating a bunch of connections to actually start saying, can we disambiguate these? Um, those of you who are familiar with OpenRefine will know that OpenRefine gets you so far. So that's where I started. Um, for the scale of the data we were processing, which I'll get to later, but like in the region of 700,000 data points, OpenRefine was slow and it didn't really allow the flexibility to um, maybe filter something to just materials um, as we, or just say nationalities as we'd have liked. Um, so there is some code and um, I'll point you towards the repository in a bit or hopefully someone in the chat will, um, that for each um, value of text in the text field, um, given certain Wikidata constraints, you can give it will generate a set of candidate um, QIDs, which are kind of Wikidata um, entity references. So you can see this as an example for people's occupations. Um, what we could then do is essentially take the top, say I think I took the top 100 or something, most occurring occupations and actually um, disambiguate them with my own intervention to make sure it was all correct to the um, correct references on Wikidata. Um, and we did that for materials and occupations and places. So that was good. We have we have some control fields already. Um, the next step was actually in the cataloging process. Um, the documentation documentation curatorial teams in within descriptions and notes fields and records had copied and pasted quite a few URLs which were either related to the record itself, so a person, object, organization, or something similar to that. So we thought can we actually resolve those using the link to open data cloud to Wikidata? Um, this required an extra step of, so say the second example down here, we have four URLs. Um, maybe one of them, maybe more of them refer to um, the actual record that, um, yeah, the, the actual thing that the record refers to. So there, there was a step of looking them up and resol resolving them to QIDs. And then there was a step of just using the type so for example if this was a person's record we can kind of filter them down to ones who have similar date of birth date of death similar name and are also people on wikidata um so using this already we got pretty good results for people and organizations just based on the urls that um, people have copied and pasted in so already nearly 30 percent of people we had a um our same as link to Wikidata, so we could, for a person, find that we had in the collection, um, find the Wikidata record. For organizations, 9% and for objects, 0%. And this was purely based on um, the, the object zero was purely based on the habits around pasting URLs into people and organization records more than object records. Um, so that is the um, Okay, so at this point, we've created a basic knowledge graph from um, a bunch of tabular CSV extracts that we've got so far. Um, none of this should be particularly, um, I guess, surprising or exciting yet. Um, so then we look at um, how can we use machine learning approaches to build lots of connections to Wikidata and also build lots of connections um, within the collections. So um, the next thing we did was built a family, well, built, built a model which sits under the family of techniques called record linkage. Um, and what we tried to do with record linkage is, um, so on the left here, we have a BBC Micro personal computer that's in the Science Museum group collection. And what we want to do is find its, find the Wikidata record for the same thing. So this goes for objects, people, and organizations. Um, so what we did was 
built a custom um, approach based on a um, machine learning classifier. So for the BBC Micro here, what, what you can think of what you do if you were trying to do this task was, okay, I know it's BBC Micro, so I'm going to go on Wikidata, I'm going to type in BBC Micro and it will give me a list of search results. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on a bunch of those search results and compare. Okay, so we can see the one on the left was made in 1985 in Cambridge by Acorn Computers. And maybe there's some more information about it um, down the page a little bit. And then we could see the one on the right was made in 1981, so close enough. Um, and we know it's a computer. We know it's subclass of home computer. And I think somewhere down the page it will also say it was made by Acorn. So essentially, we built a machine learning classifier that does that. So we trained on about, I think, 100 to 200 examples of correct links. Um, and then for each person, um, object or organization in the collection, it would go and search on Wikidata, produce a list of candidates, and then use the classifier to score whether each of those candidates it thought was a correct link. Um, we ended up, we tested a few um, pretty basic classifiers. Um, we ended up using a decision tree, but the approach we use is flexible to kind of any um, classical machine learning classifier. One issue we faced was Wikidata was difficult to query, text query in bulk um, because of the way that the architecture of the um, query service works. Um, so what we ended up doing was building an open source tool which lets you um, filter the JSON Wikidata dump, which they produce, I think, every week or every couple of weeks, um, and take it into an Elasticsearch index. Um, so we use that to query instead. Um, with this, we got about a precision of 90 to 95%, which meant that every, um, every connection that we um, added back into the knowledge graph um, nine in 10 of those we'd assume are correct, um, or maybe even uh, 19 and 20. So um, the left-hand side of this table shows where we were with just looking up URLs. Um, you can see from the right-hand side of the table after machine learning, we've now got over half of the people connected to um, Wikidata. Um, we've more than doubled the number of organizations connected to Wikidata. Um, and we have some of the objects. Um, so the issue was with objects was a, although we managed to make the process faster, the process was still quite slow because for every one of our about 300,000 records, we had to run the text search. Um, and there was another lookup to do with um, types, which we still had to rely on the Wikidata API for. Um, what that meant is we only run this record linkage process on 15,000 of the 300,000 objects. Um, most, um, so, we, so we found when doing this that people and organizations are really easy to create these same as links to Wikidata with because always with people and most of the time with organizations, if you give me two records, I can tell you whether they refer to the same thing. Um, even with that BBC Micro and that gold BBC Micro example, um, it, there's an argument about whether we should link them um, saying these, these things, these records refer to the same identical thing. So when we chose the 15,000, actually we ended up choosing categories like works of art and locomotives rather than say um, Roman coins or medals or scientific instruments, which say we might have a scientific instrument and it's an instance of this type of scientific instrument, but we wouldn't expect for it to have a Wikidata record. Um, so obviously we've got so far, but the objects, which are 300,000 um, of them in the collection, we really want to create some more connections um, to Wikidata and also hopefully within the collections as well. So the second um, family of machine learning techniques we use um, aimed to exploit the text data that Jamie was talking about in the collection. So 
Jamie used this um, Helen Sharman example too. Um, we can see that we've got a few paragraphs here of text data. And we also, um, in the Science Museum Group collection, um, well, alongside it, have a blog, which is written for the general public, which um, you can imagine creates narratives and links which wouldn't be in the collection system. Um, and also there is an academic journal, um, obviously written for a different audience, but again, the narratives and analyses and comparisons that are made in these extra sources of text, we really wanted to try and exploit these to um, create more associations within our data set of the collection. Um, and the two um, techniques we used were called entity recognition and entity linking, which I will now describe. So is the um, Helen Sharman example. Um, we first ran um, some named entity recognition over it, which I'll go into de more detail about in a minute. Um, so named entity recognition, what it allows us to do is identify passages within the text that refer to um, named entities. So um, instances of people, objects, dates, places, events, um, nationalities, you can already see how this might be useful um, as is. So um, with name density recognition here, we now have Helen Sharman as a person that's been identified, so-called that's been identified as an object, the actual spacesuit. Um, there is a so-called in the second paragraph, um, which is a kind of more specific name of that. And there's Juno, which is the mission, and there are a few dates floating around. Um, uh, the location, um, but you can imagine as is, okay, so we have a bunch of references to Helen Sharman and what happens if there are two Helen Shamans in the collection or in the um, kind of maybe in Wikidata, for example, right? So we need, we need to go one step further than that. Um, so that's where we brought in um, a set of entity linking techniques. So first, um, what we tried to do was for every entity men um, mentioned that had been predicted using the NER model, we um, trained an entity linker to try and um, link it to a collection record. Um, so you can see in this example, Helen Sharman, okay, we do actually have a record for Helen Sharman um, in the Science Museum Group co a collection already. So we can link that record up. Uh, we can link that mention up to the record um, and then for the others, um, there are a bunch of things that we don't have in the collection, especially we don't hold records for places for historical events, um, which are the two big ones, um, or say even languages, for example. Um, so um, the second entity linking model we used um, let us, um, make these connections to a space mission at the bottom and to a company which we didn't hold a record for um, in the collection at the top um, and to the Wikidata record for the spacesuit. Um, so a quick slightly deeper dive into um, these techniques that we used um, and how exactly we use them. Um, I'll go through this three set processing pipeline which describes what um, I, uh, I just talked to you about. Um, so for name density recognition, we used the popular uh, natural language processing Python library called Spacey. We developed a few custom components to let it um, tailor itself to new collections um, without a training data. So taking the, actually if you take the names of the objects, um, that you already have in your collection, you can give the name density recognition some hint of, oh, it refers to this thing. Um, I've, I've actually got this in my collection. So you can you can give the model some hints. That helps us increase the precision by 5%. Um, and we struggled with recognition of objects for the same kind of reasons I was talking to you about with record linkage. Um, second, um, we created a custom model for entity linking with a 
low training data requirement, um, which also meant it was very cost effective to run. We didn't need a big computer for it or anything, um, unlike the big Wikidata um, model. Um, I think Tim put in the chat that there are 96 million entities in Wikidata, so you can imagine the complexity of a model like this. Fortunately, Facebook Research, I think end of 2019, had released the model, so we ended up using that. Um, it was, however, expensive to run, um, and it is quite difficult to update, which is hopefully something we will explore um, more in a future project. So some high-level stats, um, about um, 350,000 SMG records um, were processed, and we also processed 325,000 DNA records. About 9,000 records we made direct connections to Wikidata, most of which were people, uh, people and organizations. And then using these information retrieval techniques, we created another 484,000 connections within the collection, 650,000 connections to Wikidata, and 1.2 million collections, connections to yet yeah, unknown entities. Quite a few of those are the dates because we didn't try and disambiguate dates. Um, and to the collection of 700,000-ish um, records across the two collections, we added 110,000 Wikidata pages, which could be a result of Wikipedia pages. Um, so coming back to the potential affordances that Jamie talked about, okay, so we've got these big numbers and we've got lots of um, connections, but then I think some point this year, we um, started to ask ourselves, what can we do with this big number of connections? So yeah, I won't take you through these affordances again, but we kind of looked back to, okay, what can we do? Um, there was one missing piece of the puzzle. Um, you can maybe see that with a bunch of links, you can't necessarily create a macro visualization. So what we did was train a family of models called knowledge graph embedding models, which take you from this, which is my bad drawing of a graph, to for each entity, you have a point in this very high dimensional space, um, which allows you to start calculating distances between entities, um, which means once you can calculate distances between entities, if you can get a 2D representation, you can make a visualization. Um, what you can also do with these distances, these distances when two things are closer together in this embedding space, they are closer together in the knowledge graph, which means they have um, maybe they're more kind of similar to each other based on all the associations we've um brought out so what we can also do is start to build kind of proto similar items or recommend the systems um and now i will take a breath before i talk to you about the demonstrators so um yeah and this is this is publicly available um i've been redeploying it so let's just refresh and check if it works um, so I'll take you through in the um, order that we built these demos. So we started um, really up close and we said that what can I do with these kind of connections if I look at one specific record? Um, so if I go to the collection site, um, and okay, there's a bunch of stuff about Sam here. Um, and I pick something. Um, we can see it's got a bit of, so it's, we have a record for Sam, which is great. We know the date it was made. It, it's got a little bit of a description, um, part of which refers to a collider, part of which refers to Geneva, which isn't um, referenced anywhere in the metadata. Um, so the first demo we built was a bookmarklet. So what this bookmarklet essentially allowed us to do was to anyone to go on a page, um, um, maybe a bit like a browser extension or something, um, and see the links that um, Heritage Connector had made from that record. So everything above kind of here is existing links. Um, we can see that, okay, like the um, name density recognition entity linking has also got the link to CERN that we already had, so that's fine, whatever. Um, 
We also now have a link to Geneva, um, which is great. But actually, if we run this again, um, talking about those embeddings and starting to look at a related items, um, I guess, engine. Um, so, so you're on this page, it's a collection site at the moment, and you kind of, there are, there, there is a related object section down here, which will take you to other things in the same part of the collection. Um, but what we actually discover when we start looking um, at the associations is, if I open this, um, we actually have the, um, the positron accelerator that that part was from. Um, so then we can run out this and then we can see, okay, it's referenced a bunch of experiments um, that were done at CERN that this was involved in. And we have all the Wikidata pages for those experiments, which is great um, because if I'm say researching, um, yeah, once I have that Wikidata reference, hopefully maybe at some point I can do the reverse lookup. Um, and if you look at a bunch of these, um, some of them are Large Hadron Collider related, there is also, um, there's a couple of related blog posts about CERN. Um, and there is also the organization CERN. So all of these were positioned similar in that embedding space, um, in a similar place in that embedding space to this record. So that's, that was, that kind of opened our eyes a little bit to start with. Um, and we, found, okay, this is this is great. Um, maybe we can make it into a widget on the collection site at some point and kind of expose people to um, this new metadata or these new um, connections. So the next thing we looked at was um, new forms of interface, um, specifically looking at how can we make a macro view of the entire collection. So can we actually get a um, heads up view of everything? Um, so what this is, is the embedding space. Um, what we can do, so the embeddings model creates 800 dimensional data, which isn't actively useful, I don't think, to any person trying to think about 800 dimensions in data point. What we can do is we can use a family of um, models called dimensionality reduction models. We use DMAP here to condense those 800 dimensions into two dimensions while kind of maintaining um, the uh, clusters, I guess, within the data um, or to 3D. Um, so we built this demonstrator. So you can see all this blue, um, all these blue points are new Wikidata points that were added. Um, all these red points of people, um, and then all these orange points are kind of um, are things in the Science Museum Group collection. Oh, we also produced one of these for um, showing both the collections together, um, but it takes a little bit longer to load. So go and have a play with that after. Um, what we can, oh yeah, so there are some archival documents, which are purple things, um, and somewhere down here, he's, he's brown of the blog post, um, and these pink are some, um, from the Science Museum Journal. Um, so if we color this by collection category, um, we can start to see the clusters that have been formed by the knowledge graph. Um, and actually, so we've got the internal collection categories that were curate, created by curators of surgery next to clinical diagnosis, next to therapeutics. Okay. Um, so all of this next to pharmacy where lab medicine. So all of this is kind of a medical section. Up here, it looks like we've got some railway um, related um, records. Down here, we've got photographic technology next to cinematography. Um, so if I'm then particularly interested, say in what's down here. So it looks like I've got a bunch of stuff related to Kodak down there. So what I can do is click a few and create a little collection of things on the side. And then for each of these, um, they'll be connected to other things. So these are, these are the same connections used around the bookmarklet, but I can start to explore a bit more visually um, the collection or the knowledge graph. Um, 
And then if we go somewhere here, what we find is nice um, new clusters of stuff that we didn't actually have in the collection before. So this this is Wikidata, but this is all from Wikidata. Um, and if I look down here, I've got a bunch of historical events. Um, I can never find the bit on bands and musical artists that will stick with events. Um, but okay, so let's say I have, there's a record for the Isle of Wight Festival now, which is linked to a bunch, turns out there's loads of stuff in the collection that refers to the Isle of Wight Festival, um, or the Child and the Music Festival, um, or Easter. Um, so if I pick, say, one of these, uh, let's go for the Commonwealth Games. Um, so I can open this Wikidata page. Um, I still don't really have a way to follow my nose, right? So I, I've got this is linked to a bunch of other things, um, but we still were struggling with, okay, so I can go to a page, open the bookmark, click on one page, open the bookmark. Um, so that is the reason for the third demo. So the third demo, I think, I somewhat unimaginatively named the Metadata Explorer. What we can do is take that um, Wikidata page for the Commonwealth Games, and we can stick it in here, and it will show us um, the connections to, from, and then the related um, records, so the things um, close by an embedding space to anything that's an anonymous graph. Um, so, I can, I've got photographs for someone. Um, I can then open this um, particular archive page. Um, and then I have a bunch of related um, records. Um, and I can kind of keep going. Um, so, see if we'll cut. Um, and we, we started to find quite nice um, ways to use this. So, say places which we didn't have um, a record for before. Um, in the Science Museum group or the or the PNA collections, we can now I can go to Osaka and based on based on associations, there are a bunch of um, Japanese towns and cities nearby in the knowledge graph. There's quite a few different objects people um, that mention Osaka say these couple of turntables, um, but we can also see some stuff from the Science Museum group collection. And also some stuff from the VNA's collection. Um, and then maybe, or not in this instance, but maybe from the um, blog um, or the channel as well. Uh, so we can start to look at concepts and see across collections what is connected to it and what is related to it. Um, and yeah, that is, I think, the kind of summary of the demos we built and and the technical work we did. So I will now hand over to whoever is next. Okay, so there's a few questions. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Okay, so there's a few questions come up, so I will field those over to you. Um, so the first question is, did we encounter any problems with the accuracy of Wikidata? And then and do we spend time uh, contributing back to Wikipedia or Wikidata entries on these collections? Feel free to jump in too, Jamie. So we didn't particularly look at the quality of Wikidata. One issue that we found was the thinness of some records in Wikidata. So sometimes we'd be trying to connect to a record in Wikidata and actually it was too thin for us to really figure out whether it was a correct connection and arguably the use of that, the usefulness of that record at the time to us was kind of limited. Um, we are, we had some ideas of contributing back to Wikidata and using this data, we could, what we didn't predict was the property type or the relation type. So there is maybe more human intervention involved with contributing some of this information back to Wikidata um, than to kind of just displaying it, especially with the level of uncertainty that we have. 
Is it worth also saying, I mean, the, in terms of textual information, and particularly Wikipedia, we, we are using it for disambiguation, but the, the, the biggest thing for us for Wikidata <clears throat> was a, a, a single unique ID. So if we have a place or an event, we can give it an ID, and from that ID, we can get to other systems. So even if all the text was gibberish on Wikipedia, it wouldn't really make any difference to this project. The, the, the point is that we want something that says, this is World War II, or this is Osaka. Um, obviously, if, if it said that Osaka is sitting, if all the links from Osaka were all wrong, we'd have problems. But I don't. we didn't really encounter many problems with jumping through. So where there were other collections listed on Wikidata, those seem pretty good. And that's the, 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 as it goes, the, the level of detail of cataloging on Wikidata might mean we couldn't disambiguate dis our records to Wikidata, but actually the content on Wikidata, we we aren't actually using what the, the biggest thing we were doing is building the connections. Um, and so it's just, we need a number to say this is um, in regards to whatever language it is. There's a concept called strings, not things, and some people might be familiar with, but instead of us having a string called Osaka, it's Osaka is Q1907. And that means that whatever language you're talking about, or whatever system you're talking about, it's you can all agree that that's Osaka. So that's... Great. Uh, so the next question is, um, are, are the links typed or do they have, um, do, so do they, are the properties within the knowledge graph, do they form part of a particular knowledge graph specification like CDOC CRM, which is, uh, CDOC CRM is the um, International Council of Museums um, linked open data format? Okay. Um, so we, just, okay. So we decided from the start of the project, even when um, looking at kind of create, like applying what we already had um, to a linked open data ontology, that we wouldn't focus too much on ontology. Um, this became um, especially an especially kind of important decision to have made when we looked at creating connections from text, because what you find is um, there is a family of methods called relation extraction where I can say I've got two entities that I've extracted and I can predict the relation between them, but actually the state of the art of them, they're not nearly accurate enough for us to be able to map relations and text back to, say, CDOC CRM predicates. Um, so our relations, when it looks at new connections we've made, are basically either our same as or they are kind of predicates that we've made up, which are typed by the type of the entity that was predicted. So location, event, person, object, etc. Great, a few more questions coming in here. Um, are the URLs we uh, um, derived um, from the CSV fed back into the collection management system or do they only live in the knowledge graph? Jamie, do you want to take that one? Oh, again, John. Do, you, do the... Um, ah, the URLs coming back. Yeah, do, have we put them back into the collection management system or does this sit? It sits outside it. I mean, there is, particularly for the disambiguation of people, um, one of our thoughts is that we could, not as part of this project, but looking longer term, can we actually use that to kind of... Um, some kind of tool to allow sort of documentation of to quickly go through and say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, as a way to get them back, get them back in. I mean, we, we would love to have persistent identifiers on our um, people and company records inside our uh, so uh, uh, our collection management systems. So long term, we'd like to bring the persistent identifiers, the Wikidata ones, back into our um, people records, but um, for the rest of the, the uh, graph, we'll leave it outside probably. Great, a couple more questions and then we'll move on. So um, would it be would it be possible to incorporate other sources like uh, um, journals uh, and other kind of source textual source materials, um, you know, published um, online in various formats? For sure. Um, in terms of creating connections, kind of any source of text, um, we specifically adapted our models to identifying 
entities that might refer to SMG and VNA collection records first. Um, I believe Tim later on will talk a bit more about adapting some similar methods to broader collections. Great. So yeah, the later question is um, like in in your in your view, how easy would it be to replicate the work done now that there's a kind of established process? Like, so I guess how much of the work is finding the best methods for, and how much of it is applying the methods to particular content sources? I think in terms of replicating what we've done with someone with the right skills it should be relatively straightforward i think the issues are in that we're definitely where we should be which is at the end of a research project kind of phase and we haven't looked into how do we um best integrate human input whether it's expert historical human input whether it's members of the public into this how do we integrate into how do we feed the data back into collections management systems how do we make sure the models are up to date how do we make sure if someone goes and vandalizes Wikidata, we're not bringing that stuff back, et cetera. Um, so yes, the methods are repeatable to some extent now, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend taking them too far ahead of where we are. It's about to say, Colin, I, what we've identified is a pipeline of steps that we think work and we've, we've published the code. Um, so it's not, it's not a system you could just pick up and chuck your data at, but it is a series of steps and documentation we think would prove useful. Is it worth saying, because I mean, Kenyan as well, actually, on the, on the, on the end linking models, how much that over the course of the project, actually some of these models were changing very fast while we were actually using them. So um, it sort of it is a moving target as well. So in some ways, looking at the techniques and what we found as good techniques might, we thought would most possibly be more useful than building one, one perfect tool that, did it all, which I think probably wouldn't do it all for everyone. So it's, um, I hope the document turns into like really good documentation. So hopefully that'll be useful. Great, one last question. So has the experience of building the knowledge graph made you consider cataloging practice, such as including linked data URLs at source, so you don't have to infer them later and the extent yeah. to which that would be valuable? It was, a, I mean, actually right back at the beginning, the very, very first step came and said, and it wasn't an intentional thing. It was just that in some of the notes fields that historically internally notes with URLs have been pasted in. And sometimes they weren't the correct URLs. It was something like been the auction house that um, sold us it. And so we had to disambiguate which ones were likely to be the real URL or not. Um, but yeah, every single URL we get that's correct in our system makes everything else you do easier. Um, is that fair to say? So the more knowns you know, the easier it is to find the unknown. So a lot of this is sort of, you start with what can we figure out? And the more things you know are certain, it makes it easier to find the rest. So yeah, it's the, the, the more that can be disambiguated to start with, the better the rest of it will be. So that's a spoiler alert for the, for the final report, which will come out early next year. <laughs> Great, so we're out of time for that section. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Kellyan. So next is um, Jane. So over to you. 